So I hope you, that after the, the copious and delicious meal, I won't fall asleep. So if I do, please shout. It would be really embarrassing on my side. So, uh, so this is me, like 10 years ago. Uh, my name is Fernando Casares. Uh, you can call me Fer. Uh, I'm, I'm a developmental geneticist by, by training. So I'm, I'm interested in, in processes in biology that occur uh, in the space, spatial scale, from the hundreds of micrometers to the close to the meter, but basically centimeters or close to, to, uh, to the meter. And that happen also in time scales that are longer than the ones that we be, we've uh, been seeing uh, up to now. Uh, the process I'm, I'm going to describe are fractions of hours to days. Right? So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm crossing a bit into the mesoscopic uh, uh, size of things. Right? So uh, my, my work deals with, with organ growth and mostly with Drosophila melanogaster. So you will see uh, lots of examples of, of uh, Drosophila uh, coming up. But uh, we also, since we are interested in understanding how uh, growth is controlled and how it, it varies, we also work with different other organisms, mostly insects, uh, like this fly here or this uh, wonderful creature here, which is a basal insect. Um, I work in this institute here, which is called the Andalusian Center for Developmental Biology in Sevilla. It's in Sevilla, in Seville, Spain, also a great city. If you haven't come, next time you, uh, uh, you come to uh, Europe, uh, come and visit. And it's not far from the beach, so this one uh, group meeting that we had a couple of, of summers ago, right, going from Sevilla to the, to the coast, uh, just to entice you to, to visit. And specifically, uh, within the institute, the, 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 the CADI, uh, I work within a, a unit that contains all these different groups uh, here uh, that is called uh, decision-making in cell collectives. And what we aim at understanding within this unit generally is how collectives of cells uh, talk to one another to generate organs, to regenerate organs, or to uh, change organs during evolution. This is the, the basic aim of what we do in this, in this unit within uh, our institute. And just simply to give you an idea that I came all the way from the south of Spain, here's where Sevilla is, there's Portugal, this is Madrid, and then I came through uh, Dubai to Bangalore. And I did that uh, because I'm like you, I'm a strong believer that uh, as Darcy Thompson uh, said many years ago, uh, the fertile field of discovery lies for the most part on those borderlands uh, where one science meets another. We are going to talk about biology, physics, chemistry, uh, all these days. So, uh, it's, so it's here when I have to stop and, uh, and thank very much uh, VJ and, and Buzzbaum for uh, inviting me to come uh, and have the opportunity to actually meet you all. And, and uh, some of you are actually working at those borderlands between physics and, and biology and to learn from you. So uh, when, when I came, uh, when, when I accepted the invitation, uh, uh, I, I asked uh, Vijay, can I come a few days earlier and join the preschool? And I wanted to do the, the, that because of two reasons. First, to, to uh, come over my jet lag and, and be a kind of reasonable person again. And the other is for my own education. And, and being here in the preschool is being great. Uh, and he asked me, okay, now that you're going to come for a preschool, would you give some lectures? Yes. Uh, you're, you're inviting me over. Of course, I will give you a uh, um, couple of lectures. And the, the things I will try to um, discuss in this, these two lectures are very basic things. Basic things that every day I wake up and I go to the lab, I find important for my research. They might be too basic for many of the biologists in the audience. Uh, it might be uh, useful for uh, some of the physicists and engineers also in the audience. And, and okay, if, if someone at some point uh, feels that this is very basic, just uh, let me know. And of course, at any point, I think that you're a very uh, active audience. If at some point you want to discuss something, uh, go ahead, interrupt, and we can, we can talk about it. 
further detail. So today, my aim is to discuss genes and gene function. Although genes have been around us in, in textbooks for many years now, still it's a bit puzzling that the concept is not clear. Because it's not even clear to me. I'm a bit too thick to, to get it, but uh, you will see that it's not a straightforward concept. And I would like to reconstruct what a gene is, what gene, genes does, and, and how they are regulated, and how they contribute to generate structures, biological structures, in these scales, time and, and space. Just simply to, to remind you about uh, what we want to understand. We want to understand things such as these that we find in nature. This is a case of a fly uh, in which it's, it's proboscis, it's like the mouth parts. It's this extremely long tube, sometimes like five times the length of the, the rest of the body. And this has been developed during evolution to actually match uh, getting the nectar from these long tubular flowers. So these, these two organisms have been co-changing for many years so that their morphology of their organs match one another in a, in, a, in a kind of weird way. Because if any of these two organisms were to uh, do not exist, the other would die immediately. Right? So we, we see this, this kind of, of extreme morphological changes happening in nature. Uh, on the other hand, in nature, we also see some sort of intermediate forms. So you already are seeing that we are looking at uh, flies all the time, as examples. They are a great group to study uh, morphology of organs. You find that there are flies that have a leaking uh, mouth, but some of them actually have these already elongated mouth parts. These, these are the, the mouth parts of a, of a fly of the group that transmits the tsetse uh, disease, the tsetse flies. And, excuse me, we also know that uh, these morphological aspects, I'm, I'm talking about here about mouth parts, but it could be any other uh, uh, feature, is, in, is influenced by the action of genes. Right, so we know that if this is the, the, uh, uh, the face of a normal fly, this is Drosophila, there are mutations, which is just simply alterations in, in genes, that result in the partial transformation of these mouth parts, these are the, the lips of a fly, uh, with different types of mutations, these lips will change their morphology, re resembling a little bit these elongated parts. So we know that uh, the, the size and shape function of organs uh, changes during evolution, over long periods of time, and that their morphology is controlled or influenced by uh, but Then I come to, um, to a paradox again. So if, if I ask you which two organisms are these two, no one is going to fail. So for example, you, what's this and what is that? Exactly, a mosquito and a fly. You got it right uh, first time. If I ask a zoologist about what, what these two organisms are, he or she would become uh, enraged, saying, OK, don't you think I'm qualified enough to recognize a mosquito on a fly? But if you ask me, or uh, in general, any developmental geneticist, uh, we see that like a blurred image. We don't, we don't know the difference. We, we can qualify, even quantify the difference. In general, the mosquito is slimmer and longer longer legs than the, the, this chubby fly, longer and thinner abdomen. Uh, the, the fly has rounder wings. This has elongated wings. It seems that there is some general pattern of stretching the body plan of a fly into a, that of a mosquito. But in terms of how these two totally different morphologies associated with totally different functions are generated during development, we don't know. Okay, so there's a huge gap between what seems obvious what seems the mechanisms underlying that morphology. So that's, that's basically the major question that, that we want to tackle. Many other people, of course. But let's go back to the definition of a gene. Because I think that, that by, uh, by delving a little bit into what a gene is or does, we'll get to some fundamental issues that will help us understand how organisms are built. So uh, perhaps we can, we can just run a quick quiz here in the audience uh, and hear what you think a gene is. And you tell me what a gene is. And, and I mean, the uh, opinions of biologists and 
pieces are equally welcome. So what a gene is. Oh, tell me some attributes of genes. Yes? A headed one. Okay. Okay, so it might ver it, it varies. It's a, it's a, it's, you said that it's, a, it's, it's part of a DNA molecule. It varies, right? It changes. And this evolution plane. So the, the, we, we've come from one property to one molecular description that. Uh, also has some uh, dynamic component to it, which is changes in the composition of this DNA molecule. A rear of information, ooh, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, there's information going on. Although, I don't want to go into this information con uh, concept because it's, again, a complicated one. There is information, yes. So basically what, what that means, I guess, is that you have a particular DNA molecule, or perhaps a number of them, there's a function that transform these into something uh, that we can quantify as a physical entity. So, Heritable. There's a DNA molecule, so DNA is. So you know that, that DNA is, in general, the, uh, the molecule that uh, is carrying this information that varies during evolution. But you know also that there are some uh, organisms that won't use DNA as the primary storage. There's also RNA, which is a similar molecule to DNA. And. and um, yeah, we have a we have a lot of lots of the attributes of 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 genes. So indeed, these are basically, in a way, summarizing those, these two levels of description that I have here. On the one on the one hand, there's the transformation of of this genetic information into shapes. That's for your uh, fellow student. Uh, called information, okay. uh, and, and actually Gregor Mendel, Mendel, this guy over here, was the one who first uh, uh, imagined this information being packaged in some sort of quanta of information, which uh, were later called genes, and that were responsible as uh, chemical entities for uh, directing different phenotypic traits. Okay, so here we have two words. One is genotype and one is phenotype. So I might use these two terms during the, the, these, uh, these talks. And you, you must remember the phenotype is something that you can, you can see, the appearance of, of an organism and that includes uh, all the traits that you can measure, like say, shape, form, function in any way, physio physiology, etc. And like distinguished from the genetic content of the organism. That's what we call the genotype. Collection of the information uh, are written in DNA molecules that are, are the genes. So, so uh, we, we, will, we will go at some point into specifying a little bit more how this DNA molecule is actually uh, organized so that it function in uh, uh, storing and uh, conveying information. But uh, yes, yeah, suffice to say at this point that it's usually DNA and that different, uh, this DNA is, is a polymer. Excuse me if I'm, I'm going to do the real basics, but just in case someone is, is missing some of these, the DNA is a polymer and uh, it's a long polymer actually. And uh, there will be different regions uh, in, along this polymer that depending on the composition 
uh, of the polymer will have different functions. And we'll get to uh, the specific functions of all these regions perhaps later on. So again, to get, uh, to, get to, to, the, to what genes are and how genes originated, um, I, every time I wake up in the morning, I say, what are we? We are tripartite system. So uh, this is really important uh, because uh, for those biologists in the audience that perhaps don't know uh, this thing, this is just a very uh, uh, easy experiment. I've done it myself. Apparently, it's easy. This water goes to a, a temperature gradient. Right? When you generate in, in a liquid a temperature gradient, there will be convection. A convection. There will be the, the, uh, the heated water will be less dense, will go up, and that will generate some movements within the mass of water. But at some critical points, what you find is that this water will be organized itself in these sort of patterns of columns that actually resemble a little bit uh, uh, cells. This is an exper the experiment that, that is called uh, uh, the uh, Bernard cells. So at, at, with specific conditions of this gradient of, of uh, temperature, this liquid will organize itself into uh, a stable structure for these uh, cells being formed. So this is basically what we are, uh, uh, in a way. So we use a gradient of energy. Primarily, it's the gradient that, uh, that is uh, uh, generated by sunlight. And the plants are the first ones to intercept that gradient and transform it into organic matter that we are going to eat. And therefore, we are able to maintain, maintain ourselves because we eat plants, which is nothing else but the energy of the sun transformed into chemical energy. And that will uh, allow us to maintain ourselves as, stru as structures like these ones or, or more complex, I would argue. There are a number of things that we have in addition uh, to what uh, these Bernard cells uh, have. So as you, uh, you've already mentioned, there's this uh, process of heritability. So that means that uh, these structures, this structure can be replicated uh, in, uh, at different instances. And this is something that the Bernard experiment won't do by itself. If you want to generate this again, you have to come up with a new pan, a new uh, uh, volume of water, again, a heater, and you will do it uh, yourself. You will need a, an external agent doing that. Ourselves uh, can replicate this. If, if we were uh, these uh, uh, Bernard cells, we would be able to do this, replicate, grow, replicate, and generate two little Bernard experiments, and so on and so forth. So we are, uh, in a way, we are machines that can replicate these structures. And we are not only dissipative systems that generate structures, but we can maintain ourselves over long uh, time periods. That brings me to the, to the origins of life. Right? So when, when we talk about organisms like ourselves, things that are alive, we think about structures that uh, are maintained in structure and function over relatively long periods of time. Remember that our cells are descendants in a, a, an uninterrupted lineage from organisms that were uh, uh, living on Earth like 4,000 million years ago. So although we are variations from those initial bacteria, okay, basically we've, we've been a, a, we are variations of the same structure uh, evolving over time. So it, I have a yes, I have I have here a slide. So here is, is for for the uh, uh, for the uh, joy of the physicists. We wouldn't we wouldn't uh, 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 say that these particles that are arising from collisions in a in a particle accelerator and that by bumping into some new nuclei, generate more of them, are alive. Although this is called the, the, the time these uh, particles are detected lifetimes. But because we consider things uh, alive if they live for longer periods than femtoseconds or whatever the unit uh, this is. Let's go back to the potential conditions that originated life on Earth. So one potential scenario is that uh, uh, life uh, arose close to hydroth uh, hydrothermal vents, which are uh, cracks on the Earth's uh, uh, crust that allow the, the release 
of not only uh, hot water, they, they heat up uh, water, but there are also uh, uh, inorganic compounds rich of energy. So here you have a source of rich energy. So it's believed that very early on, there were systems that were able to uh, transform these, uh, uh, these high content, high energy content uh, compounds into gradients of some sort. So basically what happens is that by using that energy, the first organisms were able to isolate to some extent themselves from the outside and generate a gradient of molecules by using energy. It would generate this asymmetric distribution of molecules in the outside and the inside. Think about this as, as uh, very simple bubbles, but with a lipid, lipid-like membrane around them uh, that had, were not very permeable to some of these uh, uh, molecules. So with, the, with this gradient, which we all would call the electrochemical gradient, how our bacteria uh, uh, transform the energy from the sun into, that come from the plants in terms of, uh, in the form of chemical molecules like sugars into uh, chemical energy usable by the cell. This is what our mitochondria uh, uh, do uh, nowadays. So basically what they do is take up uh, these nutrients, they oxidize them, and generate a gradient of protons outside the membrane of the bacteria. So they use that, that, uh, that energy to pump uh, protons out. And then there's a machine, molecular machine, that will use that energy accumulated in that gradient to generate specific chemical bonds that are usable by cells to do their own uh, cellular stuff. Okay. So, Initially, you would imagine that you needed DNA to make a living organism, or RNA for that matter. Okay? We're having like these sort of protocell with a certain concentration of things inside, close to a source of energy, would by some chemical means generate an electrochemical gradient and use that electrochemical gradient to make structures, to make more uh, organic molecules, to build more of itself. Okay? And eventually to duplicate and generate uh, more uh, like itself, like that would be reproduction. So just, I, I just simply uh, uh, bring, you, bring your attention to uh, uh, the molecules that are involved in, uh, in accumulating the uh, energy from these electrochemical gradients. So one of these molecules is called NAD, and here you will see uh, uh, this structure over here that contains this molecule here, which is uh, adenine, that's a sugar and a phosphate. And this, this, uh, uh, and this uh, uh, molecule has uh, this link between these two phosphate groups, okay, that is important in uh, uh, storing energy. This is also the case for ATP. Perhaps uh, even physicists have already studied that the cells store their chemical energy in the form of ATP. It's basically the same molecular structure with a number of phosphates, actually three, and in these chemical bonds is where the energy is stored. But I just simply wanted to bring these uh, uh, molecules up here, which is basic biochemistry, to show that the units that form the DNA polymer or the RNA polymer are molecularly very similar to these guys. Okay, actually this one, this nucleotide that has this A here, this adenine here, is basically the same one as this one, right? Only with, without these phosphate groups here. So in a, in a, in a way, and this is just simply uh, something that might evoke some, uh, uh, some thinking, the information storing uh, molecule actually built up uh, with the same units that all the biology on Earth uses 
to use energy and to move energy from one place to another. Okay? That's, that's basically uh, what, what this uh, ring, uh, this ladder is made of. These guys are polymerized, and this is the structure, for example, of RNA. Okay? These uh, units are bound to one another, and in making these bonds, in making this molecule, this polymer, the energy goes into making these inter-nucleotide uh, 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 covalent bonds. Yes. So there's ATP, GTP, which stores energy. Are there also creatures that use TTP, CTP? You mean uh, as? As ATP and GTP? No. Why that asymmetry then? It, it, might, it might be have some sort of, of uh, crystallization of some, some uh, uh, um, uh, initial biochemistry. Having said that, uh, you will see that TDP and GTP are used also as molecular signals affecting the behavior of certain molecules that uh, 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 transmit signals uh, uh, within cells. And this, this is really, uh, excuse me, interesting. Is the fact that uh, when the uh, cell runs out of energy, so it, it cannot synthesize uh, this molecule, uh, these molecules cannot add uh, electrons here, it cannot add more phosphates uh, rich in, in energy, this molecule cycles over itself to generate this molecule, which is called cyclic AMP. And this cyclic AMP is the general distress signal that from bacteria to us signals the fact that the cell is running out of energy. Okay? You cannot make this, this molecule, so you make this one by default because you cannot extend this phos phosphate uh, chain uh, further. And it's interesting that bacteria, when they are running out of food, they will synthesize cyclic AMP and, well, I'm, I'm a bit uh, embarrassed to, to uh, bring this work that has been done uh, uh, major extent by, by Professor Nanjundia uh, here. But uh, this is one example in which uh, this molecule is used to signal uh, a very important event, is that when a cell is running out of food, many other cells are going to be running out of food, and they are going to not only keep the cycling, cyclic IMP for themselves, but they, they start producing it. And this is a general signal, okay guys, there's no food around, we have to do something, right? So uh, uh, cyclic IMP is used to organize a collective behavior of, uh, of uh, amoeba-like organisms that will cluster together and, and form a structure that will help these organisms to survive the harsh times and also to disperse uh, in the hope that they will, uh, they will be fine uh, greener pastures at some other point. Okay, and this is basically what happens here. Uh, when the, when the uh, ame uh, amoeba are, uh, are starving, they will uh, synthesize cyclic AMP, they will start aggregating, and they will form this structure that is already like one of, the, uh, uh, one of these beautiful uh, uh, structures in which these amoeba, which are all of them initially the same uh, type of cell, of cell, will start like forming different cell types in specific numbers and distributing themselves in different uh, uh, locations to generate uh, these uh, fruiting points. It's basically one uh, structure that will keep some cells in a, in a resting state, in a protected state, like spores, that will uh, allow this organism to disseminate uh, and to uh, wait until uh, better times come. So the general idea would be that we can make cells without DNA, in principle. Like those primitive cells likely didn't have DNA or RNA, but they, they were really dependent on the external conditions. You can imagine one of these protocells uh, uh, drifting away from uh, the, the uh, hydrothermal vent in a cold medium in the middle of the sea with no nutrients, it will be immediately collapse and die. So it won't, it won't give us to any of us uh, uh, throughout evolution. So in, in some way, perhaps one, one can think that genes 
DNA or RNA, um, what they do is to ensure that certain concentrations within cells are maintained within uh, certain levels. Those levels of chemicals are the ones required to maintain that cell alive, which means that it will be able to uh, uh, stay as a structure for a long period of time and eventually reproduce into two new cells. So you know, this, this will give you an idea of what the, uh, uh, the, the genes can do. And this, uh, this is a, an old experiment by Hammerling. These uh, uh, creatures here are algae, are algae, but each of these is, is a single cell. That's quite amazing. And, and these cells are this size. These are huge cells. And yet, despite the fact that they are a single cell, they can display, display a lot of different morphologies. It's like a neuron in a way, right? So you will have like a place where this cell attaches to the, to the substrate, the nucleus, which contains the DNA, is basically located, and then it will have this stalk and this umbrella-like thing. And there are different species, so the umbrella is, the, the umbrella are really, really different. So this is one of the experiments uh, that the Hammerling uh, did. So the experiment runs like that. So if you get, you make like a fusion of cells in which the nucleus is of the green species, and on top of it, you transplant a bit of the, the stock of these brown species, it gives rise, it uh, gives rise to, is a, a, is a the, the, the structure that comes up there is not like the brown one, but the green one. So that tells us that this green nucleus is acting on this bit of the cytoplasm, which is brown, and transform the whole structure again into uh, a, a green cell. This is something that, that uh, again, goes back to uh, his definition of, of, uh, of a gene or genes. The genes which are located because they are made of DNA in the nucleus, the nucleus tells the cell what to do. In this case, is the, this complex morphology of the cell. There is some, some other experiment that, that uh, uh, Hammerling did before, which I find particularly interesting. If you take one of these single cells, and you divide uh, these cells into three pieces, and this one here contains the nucleus, and you culture them independ indep uh, independently, this one will give rise to a full cell with all its morphology. That's fine. It contains the nucleus, it's fine. This one will quickly degenerate. It doesn't. But this one that contains a piece of the cytoplasm of this cell, if allowed, to, uh, uh, to develop for a little while, you will end up forming this other structure over here. Of course, over time, since it doesn't contain a nucleus, it will degenerate. But in terms of the morphology of the structure, it doesn't need a nucleus. It means that the concentration of cellular components present in here which are determined by the nucleus, are sufficient to, to uh, produce this self-organized pattern. Okay? So again, reinforcing the idea that what genes do in the nucleus is to uh, control a concentration of all the molecules that a cell contains. Another question, so more physics-y thing. So you said this is about a centimeter in size, roughly? It's about a centimeter? Yes. yes. Yeah. So then, I mean, transport of molecules, uh, is that by diffusion? Because at this scale, gravity will be very important. You can't neglect uh, gravity. So are there active mechanisms like in neurons, uh, or is that known? I have no idea. Perhaps it's known. But at the time these experiments were made, uh, it wasn't known. And, and this was the result. So whatever the, the, uh, the mechanism, there's any, it allows the, the, the mixing of these uh, contents and then for genesis of the of the whole thing happen. Right. <laughs>
Yes. Right, that's, that's correct, but since you have now, when you mix the two of them, you have a, a, a bit of a cell that contains concentrations from the other species. But now you have a nucleus that will start producing a protein from the other, so you are going to change the concentration quite dramatically. And for whatever the reason, and that's an interesting point, it might be that it's either one or the other sets of concentrations that are allowed and nothing in between, perhaps. It's not, there's no mixing. But it's a good point. Exactly, exactly. You must think that without DNA, you have a cell with, with molecules distributed, and here, the major uh, uh, factor here would be this gamma uh, uh, BJ has been talking about. This is, there's no synthesis, so everything is degradation. So there are half, uh, half times and things like that, and these will be the ones that are going to determine what's the, the life of, of uh, these cells without a nucleus. Making sense? Making sense? Okay. So, your, uh, uh, yes, that thing about which concentrations and, and, and how the nucleus influences the concentration of cells is a really, really uh, uh, important question. So, so far, I think that uh, I would be defining genes not only a single gene, there's no, there's no organism that contains only a single gene. Uh, that is alive, not viruses. Uh, I would say that, that uh, what genes provide is a memory of successful concentration. And I, I mean successful, those that have been passed on generation over generation. You, you could imagine messing up a cell, right? M messing up the gene so the concentration is not, uh, okay, the cell will die, okay, the cell doesn't reproduce, those genes are not perpetuated uh, in, in the system. And also act as regulators, so that these concentrations keep certain ranges, which is what we've just discussed. The fact that we have a nucleus, which has a certain uh, nuclei, controls genes, excuse me, control concentrations that will end up having a particular morphology in that particular cell. I think that this is, so far, a good definition of what genes are. It's been written uh, uh, using DNA molecules. So, you might know this already, but uh, it's important to distinguish that, in general, uh, genes comes in two, two types, two flavors. So, this was perhaps uh, most clearly illustrated uh, uh, in, the, in the 50s and 60s by work of these two guys, uh, Jacob, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, Jacob, and this was Monod, uh, who uh, were working with bacteria, with E. coli, the bacteria that colonizes, one of the bacteria that colonizes our, our intestine. And, and, and they identified uh, what was called the lac opera. This is a piece of DNA. Okay? There are segments on, on this DNA that are functionally different, but they are made of DNA all the same. So uh, this piece of DNA produced a number of genes, excuse me, produced a number of transcripts, a number of uh, uh, RNA molecules, these three, Z, Y, and A, that each of them codes for different proteins. Uh, We'll get into the, 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 the transcription of these genes. Depends, of course, on a, a big machine that is called RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase won't bind any site on the DNA. It chooses specific uh, regions of the DNA to be bound. So this sequence here in, in orange is specifically recognized by these uh, multimolecular complex enzymes and sits in there. And if nothing else happens here, would like to transcribe this piece of DNA 
to generate these three messenger RNAs that would produce protein Z, protein Y, and protein A. So these proteins in here do things within the cell, right? One of them, laxine, is capable of breaking uh, a sugar called uh, lactose into two uh, simpler sugars, galactose and glucose. So, uh, so one strategy the bacteria might have is that, okay, since these bacteria sometimes encounter as nutrients uh, lactose in the medium, they, uh, these uh, bacteria might be producing always uh, a laxi genes, because if there's some uh, glucose, uh, uh, lactose molecule, it will take up, break it down. But what if, in the medium, there's no uh, lactose? That would be a waste, because remember, they have to polymerize messenger RNAs. They have to translate these messenger RNAs into proteins that, if there's no lactose in the medium, will have a half-life of whatever, and it will, it will be degraded. Lots of energy wasted. So uh, what this system allows is that the production of the beta-galactosidase and these other genes is regulated. So only in the presence of lactose, there will be production of beta-galactosidase. So how does this work? Lactose can enter the cell, and that's, that's a trick. I won't get into the details. But if there's lactose in the medium, it will go through the, uh, uh, the membrane of the bacterium uh, and it will get and bind this other protein. That is, this is constitutive. So if there's no lactose, the repressor sits on this sequence and blocks sterically the movement of the polymerase to transcribe this gene. Okay? We have the genes, polymerase is here. Uh, the polymerase would like to transcribe these, these guys, but have, has a big protein sitting in between that won't allow the movement of the polymerase, and therefore it won't be able to read or transcribe the gene. But if there's lactose, lactose binds to this repressor and changes its, its conformation. So it now it detaches from the DNA, and the polymerase will vroom, run through uh, this uh, sequence producing uh, beta-galactose. So only in the presence of lactose, the uh, bacteria will, uh, uh, will go through the burden of producing this enzyme. So as you see, these proteins are regulated, and they do things uh, uh, controlling the amounts, again, concentrations within, with, within the cell. So again, since the cell would like to maintain in BJ's terminology, steady state concentration of glucose in the cell, if this concentration goes down, and the animal has uh, uh, gal uh, galactose, uh, lactose to use, then it will do something to uh, uh, produce more glucose. I, I, I remind you that lactose can be split into galactose and glucose. Only if, if there's a departure from this uh, optimal concentration. There are other molecules, like this repressor molecule, that does not regulate the amount of proteins in the cell directly. What it does is regulate the expression of genes. Okay? So this particular uh, set of genes, this, this repressor, is encoded by a different fragment of the DNA sitting somewhere else in the genome of the bacterium. This molecule is, is called a regulator of transcription, or a transcription factor. Okay? So you, you might think that there are genes coding for action. And regulation. And these genes are transcription factors. Yes, in, in general. Of course, don't don't be uh, don't be late to confusion by, by uh, imagining that all the genes that do things that alter concentrations within cells are proteins. Okay? No. In addition to proteins, uh, uh, genes can code for, for example, uh, RNA molecules. Right? So these molecules might be, for example, proteins. 
They, they can call, uh, code for, so for RNA. So I'm going to the other side. Perhaps you've, you've heard about them, but there's a, speci a special class of, of RNAs called microRNAs. Are abbreviated like MIRS. And these are molecules that will find sequences within mRNAs that are complementary to them. And when they find these molecules, they will lead to the destruction of an mRNA. Again, these microRNAs will also regulate the concentration of molecules within cells, especially uh, since this mRNA that is going to make protein A is, uh, is destroyed, protein A, the concentration of protein A, for example, will go down. So remember that, uh, yeah, the regulators of concentrations within cells might be proteins, might be RNA, they undergo a number of uh, later modifications. Okay. So this is a slide to remind myself of, uh, of uh, showing you how genes regulate rates and concentrations. Okay, so the, we, we are getting again to the same point. Uh, uh, what genes do uh, is to keep, a, keep track of, of concentrations and rates within the cell, uh, and this is what they do. So we can, we can uh, see how this works by analyzing the effects of mutations. So this is the, this is the gene that uh, we were talking about. This region here is the promoter, and this is the region that codes for beta galactosidase. Right? So remember that this is a sequence of nucleotides. So imagine that normally in this position there's a an A, and there's a mutation here that transforms this into a T. Right? So this change in DNA, DNA sequence is going to transform this molecule in the end, because the, the amino acids that are going to be incorporated incorporated in making beta-gal are going to change. And now this beta-galactosidase, for example, is going to have a lower uh, uh, rate of transformation of lactose into glucose and galactose. Therefore, this single change, by affecting how this protein performs, is going to change concentrations within the cell. Okay, but imagine that the mutation is not here, but here. Now, there was a G here, and now this has been mutated into a C. I told you that the transcription factor recognizes specific sequences on the DNA. So imagine that now this G to C mutation, this single change, increases the affinity of binding of the transcription factor here. Again, this single change is also affecting one rate, the, the binding of the transcription factor to this sequence. By binding, very, or, uh, by binding more strongly here, it might actually trigger the increase in production of beta-galactosidase. Again, increasing the uh, uh, altering concentrations within this. Okay? They might happen here. Imagine that now this molecule here, instead of having this complementary base here, as a mutation that has changed these two uh, sides here, then the microRNA won't be able to be bound here, and then this RNA will survive for longer, will produce more protein A, again, changing the concentration of some components within this. So, genes collectively control the concentrations and rate of reactions within cells, is what we have to 
always keep in mind. Yes. This one. Okay, in this particular case, the mutation is not affecting the structure of the transcription factor. The transcription factor is exactly the same. But the sequence in here, say A, A, G, A, A, it, it's, it's, it's a binding sequence that is normally found there. This is, this, uh, 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 there's a recognition, there's a molecular recognition between the DNA binding site of this transcription factor on this molecule. Okay. Now, by changing DG to C, the structure of the DNA is going to be different. And now, because of who knows why, this transcription factor has a higher affinity. It binds better to the AACAA sequence than to the AAGAA sequence. It binds more, more uh, is more, uh, is precise there for longer, it brings more uh, coactivators, and it produces more of the protein. This is how it will work. All right. So then genes are really, really important. However, things become a, a bit uh, uh, confusing, perhaps, when one examines the number of genes estimated in, in the genomes of different organisms. So here you have what we would call simple organisms, at least morphologically simple. They might be metabolically very complex. So small organisms like bacteria or yeast used for all sorts of fermentations, uh, would contain in their genomes about 5,000 genes. However, when we go to organisms that are multicellular, from us, including flies, nematodes, and fish, rice is here, all of them contain basically the same order of magnitude in terms of genes from around 20,000, 20, 25,000. So this makes sense. I mean, there's uh, organisms that contain more complex shapes and different cell types might uh, require uh, more genes than uh, organisms here. By, but how come that with the same amount of, of, of genes, a nematode and a human being is made? Right. Or why is it that, that you need so many genes in, in, uh, in, in rice compared to what chicken? Well, there's something else that is really, really important, is that when now we take the 20,000 genes in a fly and compare these sequences, the genes, remember that genes are written DNA molecules, which are a polymer of uh, these four units. We can compare them, we can align them, and say, okay, in the first position, what do you have? An A? Yes, in both. Second position, C? In both? Yes. And so on and so forth. Two sequences of DNA that, when aligned, are 100% identical, will code, for example, for the same, exactly the same protein. Okay? So slight changes in that sequence will lead to changes in the proteins that are made by, by those. Okay? So when we compare, I, I, as I was telling you, the approximately 20,000 genes of flies with the 25,000 genes of, of humans, we find that most of them are, uh, are the same genes. They vary a little bit during evolution. They are not identical, but you can recognize the, the, the genes doing the same thing, calling for the same molecule. So then we are compelled to conclude that the same genes, basically, are able to generate organisms as different fruit flies. There are two ways of solving this, uh, 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 this current uh, uh, paradox. One is that, in the end, humans and flies are not that different from one another. The other is that we are talking about genes in general. But genes, remember that they regulate other genes. It might be the way you use these same genes uh, that generates the, di the, the diversity of morphologies. Okay, so this is basically uh, the same question. So I think that uh, the answer to that paradox, basically the, the, that the true answers are correct. 
On the one hand, flies and humans are not that different from one another. And the other is that we are dealing here with some extra uh, dimension. Yes. Okay, you, you are, you're going slightly ahead of what we, uh, of, uh, I was describing. It's just comparing the protein coding region, the, 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 the region that we can actually annotate. And when I mean annotate, I mean that we can recognize. We look at the sequence and we can uh, dry, uh, uh, write algorithms and, say, uh, and get to a particular place uh, uh, along the DNA sequence and say, okay, from here on, we have a protein coding region, very likely. But as your uh, uh, fellow student uh, was suggesting, in a genome like ours, only about 2% codes for protein. The other 98% of the DNA is non-coding. Produce RNA, but still a large proportion of the DNA at least cannot be easily read. I will tell you that now, nowadays, we know how to read that portion of non uh, coding uh, DNA. There's no, there's not such a clear uh, code for reading that part of the genome. So it's very difficult to find homology in that sequence that is non-coding, and I will tell you why. Okay. That's, that's also a very good question. It's not totally solved. Uh, uh, I, I haven't, I haven't uh, uh, got into that uh, detail. But the truth is that in, in most eukaryotes, like ourselves, a protein sequence is not coded by a contiguous stretch of DNA sequence might be made by this bit here and this bit here that when transcribed the mRNA would be this one there's an intermediate uh, step in which this piece of here in between that is non-coding is removed that's called splicing so then you will end up having here a messenger that contains both parts, and this will give rise to the protein, the ribosome. So imagine that instead of having two bits, you have three bits. Now I'm, I'm talking here about DNA. Is A, B, is B, B, C. This can be, give rise to a messenger that contains A, B, and C. But it can also be that in this splicing, uh, uh, a process in which pieces of the, DNA, of, of the messenger are removed, this one doesn't go into the final messenger. So you would have protein that is composed of A and C exclusively. So therefore, the fact that genes are made of pieces also allow uh, uh, the generation of more diversity in terms of protein products. So for example, you could imagine that this gene could, gi could give rise to protein containing A, and B and C, A and B, A and C, B and C, whatever. It might be that some of these combinations are not useful to the cell. But there's a the large combinatorial uh, uh, that can give rise to a large, larger variety of proteins. Still, this in the realm of proteomics, but we sometimes don't know really how many protein variants can be produced, generally speaking. But again, I would tell you that in general, the complexity in terms of these uh, structure of the gene, uh, this, these fragments are called exons, and the intervening sequences are called introns, is approximately equal, equally complex in a fruit fly than in, in, in vertebrates. Yeah. So there's not going to be a major difference uh, in terms of the proteome stemming from the fact that the gene structure per se different uh, in different organisms, despite the fact that the number of genes is different. 
How, how much? Yeah, so that, that, there's a whole range of variation. Okay, so, so comparing prokaryotes to eukaryotes is a, is a big leap. Right? So, there are, there, so for example, the transcription of machinery, different. But you could compare, for example, the mitochondria, which are old bacteria that came into uh, be part of the eukaryotic cell. You, can, you could compare those and the genes that derive from the, from the mitochondria. Uh, but the comparison there is, there are, there are some uh, homologies, but in closer evolutionary relatives of flies or humans, uh, the degree of conservation or variation also highly variable. It would depend largely on the functions performed by the proteins. There are proteins that are extremely conserved and some other proteins that are highly variable. <coughs> to such an extent that you won't recognize them as homologs, perhaps. They were homologs at some point, but they did diverge. So there's no, uh, there's no rule of thumb to translate that. So, okay, so, uh, so we've been thinking all the time uh, uh, within the one cell context. We could, again, we could uh, think of that as a well-stirred mixture. Or, for example, if we are talking about many cells, like, uh, E. coli, the bacterium, in culture, many bacteria, uh, we can culture them like that, and then we, we make the whole ecosystem or the whole environment or the whole medium homogeneous. But as long as you start like plating these organisms uh, 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 in space, you allow them to settle down and do stuff, you start like seeing that even the simplest, uh, uh, apparently simplest organisms like bacteria or yeast will start organizing themselves in uh, structures that even though simple, you can, you can see uh, easily that inside this colony that has, has grown, there are differences between the center and the periphery. This very simple uh, uh, organization space of, of microorganisms growing quickly, and thereafter, multicellular organisms that like making differences different from one another. This image you've seen already a couple of times before, this perhaps is the third time, and this is basically the surface of an early embryo, Sophila en embryo, in which the cells that are marked with a single color, like say these green cells, are all of them identical. That in the particular information, while these red ones are uh, identical to one another, so you start generating uh, uh, patterns. You, as soon as you include spatial dimension, uh, things get much more interesting. Okay. So in order to, to have organisms that have differences in space, the easy way of starting the process is by generating asymmetries within the first cell, which is the, the egg, right? So in this particular case, this is a Drosophila a female, and Drosophila, the body of, of Drosophila is already polarized. It has anterior, posterior, uh, uh, dorsal, ventral. Okay? So when this fly is making the eggs, because the female is polarized, it gives polarization to the cell. And this is what, what we've been discussing before in the first uh, few days. This is made because this is anteriorly pointing, and then it accumulates uh, uh, specific mRNA molecules that will generate a gradient that will set up in motion this uh, asymmetry within the embryo. That's why we end up having a head and a tail or a dorsal and eventual. Uh, uh. So the spatial cues from the mother are translated to the spatial cues of the early embryo. But here you have a little embryo. However, there are organisms that do things that are quite amazing. This is a pretty close relative to a fly. This is a, this is a, uh, this is a wasp. This is a parasitic wasp. What it does, it injects a single embryo within larvae of the parasitized flies. And this is a larva build up little creatures. So these black uh, uh, dots is the head of one larva coming from this wasp. But I told you that this wasp injects a single zygote, single cell. What happens here is that this single cell that might have inherited positional values from the mother is split into many different 
little balls of cells. So these positional information that might have been present here is totally destroyed. And yet, the final, uh, 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 each of these uh, larvae will hatch to give rise to uh, a wasp that has an anterior and a posterior uh, dorsal and ventral side. But where is the information coming from? Well, the thing is that uh, living organisms are just amazing in their capacity to organize themselves. And this is something that people, some people have shown uh, in, the, in the recent past. And what I'm showing here is one experiment by my uh, colleagues, Luciano Marcon and Jelena Raspovovic, uh, who, who uh, uh, do this experiment. It's a very simple one. They take uh, embryonic stem cells from mice, and they uh, 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 make clusters of these cells, say, containing a thousand ES cells per cluster. These cells have been genetically manipulated. So they will be green. They are mesoderm, the tissue that is going to give rise to your muscles, for example. And they will become red if they uh, are going to, to give rise to the uh, digestive so initially, when they played these, uh, uh, these, what they call embryoids, these balls of cells, each of these cells is identical to one another, initially, in a culture that contains some chemicals, and again, this is a well-stirred mixture, after 3.5 days, these guys break their symmetry and start generating a wave of expression that give, gives rise actually to this. This is, this is not an actual embryo. This is the product of this process of self-organization, in which part of these cells have become mesoderm, some others have become endoderm, the right position actually within this ball of cells. Here you have a beautiful example of symmetry breaking uh, uh, that doesn't require any external IQ uh, to be produced. These guys, if you, uh, uh, you feed them some other chemicals further, they will start elongating, forming an axis, your posterior, by themselves. Okay. So, uh, but many, I mean, most of us are already imprinted with some sort of polarity. But remember that, uh, that the uh, capacity for self-organization of biological systems is amazing. And we still don't know how this is. Uh, and what happens uh, once you have some uh, uh, polarization in your structure, then you start generating different positional values. You become, uh, you, come, you become from a one single cell to many cells, and these cells will be becoming more and more different from one another as time passes. So we've, we've already heard about uh, early models of how these gene expression patterns uh, can be produced, uh, like in reaction diffusion systems that will give rise to Turing-like patterns, this is like the zebra stripes, but these are uh, potentially generated by a similar mechanism. Uh, and when people start looking at these uh, repetitive patterns that uh, 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 Maitri described uh, yesterday and today, yesterday mostly, People like Hans Meinhardt start thinking about how this pattern of, of periodic expression bands to their eyes during development. And he uh, followed a little bit uh, ideas from uh, Alan Turing of reaction diffusion in, gener in generating these uh, patterns along the anterior posterior axis. But here's where uh, study of biology sometimes leads you to uh, non -too, uh, not too elegant solutions for this sort of patterning. So a physicist or an engineer would have said, okay, yes, I can, I can do like Hans, Me uh, Hans Meinhardt. I can set up a couple of gradients, and then by reaction diffusion, I can give rise uh, to these uh, uh, seven stripes very easily okay, with, with, with not too many parameters. Okay. However, Drosophila doesn't make its stripes by using one of these simple uh, each of these stripes is basically made independently. And how are these stripes made? These stripes 
what you are seeing here is the expression, the transcription of a gene called Eve, even skin. Okay? So, for example, this uh, stripe, which might be this one, say this stripe 4, the case, is controlled within the DNA by a DNA sequence that is called, is one of these, we are going to call them regulatory elements, like the one that is bound by the operator the lac operon that I described earlier, Jacoba Monod. Okay. This, this is a sequence of DNA here that uh, has a particular uh, DNA sequence that controls the expression of, of, the, of the gene. In this case, it's not the gene itself, but it's a reported gene. Actually, it's laxi from E. coli. I can explain that to you uh, uh, later. But basically, uh, okay, this is stripe three and seven. This single piece of DNA controls the expression of a promoter in this particular position of the embryo. And then the other tribes require a separate piece of DNA. Not such a simple system in which you have oscillations of something happening. No, each of the stripes is made independently. So this is very inelegant, if you want. Uh, but this is how it works. It has a one little advantage. Is that if you want to control the expression of this gene, even skipped, since each stripe is controlled separately, you could modify the expression in each of, each of these stripes independently. Right? If I induce a mutation in these sequences, for example, this was exactly what the Mike, Mike Levine's lab uh, did in this experiment. By changing the sequence of DNA, they could alter the expression of this transcription, uh, th this uh, expression, but not the other stripes. You think about it, that uh, uh, frees evolution to play around with this stripe or with any of the other stripes independently. It's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, in this particular case, uh, it might be the case, but this is not how it works. This is the binding site for one of the transcription factors that controls uh, that control uh, uh, this piece of DNA. So, simplify the thing. It's going to be very simplistic. But imagine that you have two genes, A and B, and this is the anterior-posterior axis, the embryo, and you want to generate a stripe here. would be a piece of DNA that would have binding sites for, say, A and B. And when A and B are bound, this would be an and logic, both of them must be present. By having these transcription factors bound to this region, a promoter will allow the RNA polymerase to transcribe and make if in tribe three, say. And why will it, this piece of DNA be activated only there? Because it's the only place where the two proteins overlap in space. Okay? In this region, you would have A, A, but not B. And here you would have not A, and B. And this enhancer will only allow the RNA polymerase to, to transcribe and produce if in, only if the two molecules are there. That experiment there, the only thing that they were, they were uh, testing is whether when I mutate something, say in this sequence here, get an alteration in the, in the The correct statement. The correct statement. Remember that what we've been describing uh, these two days is basically how you go from initially a homogeneous egg to something that contains some asymmetry here. So here, remember that this is not only I'm, I'm just simply simplifying here and saying there is going to be A and B, but we are playing around with concentrations. 
it might be that this is A, and only these high concentrations of A uh, would be effective. Right? Things like that. So once you have that, you will have a gene B expressed here. So you will have A plus B and A alone. And B can activate or repress something else. And then is how you cascade down, generating more and more refined patterns. How you do that? Because the genes that are responding to these asymmetries do contain DNA sequences that although they don't code, are capable of regulating the expression of genes, depending on the presence, absence, or concentrations of transcription factors. Can you repeat the question? They don't appear at the same time. These ones, they can, they can, they can do appear at the same time. Are usually odd? Uh, they usually, the name? The number, number of the segments, is it usually odd number? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, yeah, it's always the same because it represents the, the number of segments that are, uh, the, the, the animal has. It, it, you will see that it doesn't need to. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you why, just in the, in the next slide. So uh, again, this, this would be a, a, a one, one way in which nature would say, would say, okay, guys, don't think about too much about nice models, because I've done the things the way I liked. And that's history. So I did it once like that, and I liked it. Uh, and I kept it, so... So investigate biology. However, and you were saying, Drosophila is an extremely derived organism in insects, right? It's very recent. And the way it segments its, its body is basically all at the same time. All at once, it, the appearance of the stripes is not totally uh, uh, identical in time, uh, but they are very close in time. However, for example, when one looks at volume, this is beetle, what you have is a totally different uh, system of generating segments. This guy, what happens is that you have, a, you have waves expression. Right? You have a wave, and then you have a, a space in between, then you have another wave, they move uh, uh, until they f the, 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 the wave stops moving, right? Because the, the wave is generating because there's, there's growth in this region. So you generate a wave, the, the animal keeps growing, then another wave is generated, the animal keeps growing, another stripe is generated. This is very similar to what happens during the, the, uh, the generation of the muscle packs uh, in, in our, in, along our axis. Okay? There's, a, there's a region that grows, and as the region grows, there's this oscillator that, uh, that expresses a, a genes, and then you see these waves, and then the, the, uh, the whole system is generated by combining a growth region coupled with an os oscillator. So again, once you, even for me that uh, work with Drosophila, I would say, okay, this is nature working. Not necessarily. It might be that if you come up with a model that uh, generates spatial oscillations, in the end, nature has used it as well. So uh, think about uh, uh, biology, do your models, and perhaps it doesn't uh, apply to all organisms. It might actually be uh, uh, biologically relevant in some organisms. Exactly, this is, this, is the, this is what I meant, meant with the, uh, forming the packs of muscles. The somatogenesis is generally how it's called more so. Right, so, so we've got to a, a point in which genes are differentially expressed, and this is because they have DNA sequences that are called regulatory elements, and we call them cis because they are on the same molecule, right? This, this, this versus trans, this all nomenclature. But uh, just remember that, that they are called cis regulatory elements. They can enhance the production of a, of a transcript. Those are enhancers. They can block the transcription of, 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 a, of a gene. Those are repressor elements. But in general, these are sequences that do not code and regulate the rate of expression of genes. But they're extremely interesting. 
because they read something that uh, uh, Eric Davidson and others uh, uh, called regulatory state. Regulatory state uh, is the set of transcription factors that a cell has at any given moment. And this set of transcription factors reflect two things. On the one hand, the history of the cell. So if you're a, if you're a cell, okay, but I will stop to, to allow you to relax. Uh, so a, a cell that, uh, that is a muscle cell uh, in your arm uh, comes from the mesoderm. So the transcription factors that this muscle cell expresses contains also transcription factors that were spe specifying the early mesoderm cell. For example, twist, the uh, uh, mesoderm cell, a uh, uh, transcription. So when you generate these muscles, they might uh, uh, have twist uh, within them. That reflects the history of a particular cell type. In order to do a particular uh, muscle cell type, uh, cells are talking to one another. They are sending uh, signals, like this cyclic AMP. In, in multicellular organisms, cyclic AMP is not used, as far as I know, uh, as uh, intercellular communication signal, but it might be something similar to cyclic AMP, intercellular signal. And that will be transduced within the cell and will lead to the activation of repression of some transcription factor. So this regulatory state is a combination of the history of the cell and the actual surroundings of the cell. And that will be fed onto these C regulatory elements. These are always there, okay? but they will only become activated when the right combination of transcription factors are present. So therefore, these, these guys are nodes in gene regulatory networks. Okay? When we talk about, when we say that transcription factor A activates the laxy gene, we are not really depicting what happens here. We should say that transcription factor A activates a cis regulatory element and then drives laxy. Okay? This is how it works. And therefore, sequences, changes in the sequence here, will again affect the expression of other genes. And therefore, uh, will affect concentrations and rate constants. But now we're talking about these things happening in space. That's the, the, the key. That's why differences become different from one another as development proceeds. Okay. And I think that I will stop here. Uh, I have more material. I'm not, I'm not a, a professional, professional teacher, I'm a full-time full researcher, and that's why perhaps me, my, my teaching material is a bit erratic, but uh, uh, we can continue from, from this uh, slide tomorrow. We'll move on uh, more stuff. We'll stop here, and thank you very much.